everybody, it's me, Jill, and welcome to Jill Informed. This is the recap of The Real Housewives of Orange County, Season 17, Episode 11. It's my fiesta, and I'll cry if I want to. All right, guys, long time no see. I sat down to watch this episode last week, all, all ready to go, taking my notes, and it wasn't on. I don't know why. I don't know if Bravo was like... I don't know, rolling out a new show last week, or if they just took a week off for no reason, unclear, but uh, that's why I wasn't around. But I'm here now, so let's get started. This episode begins with, like, scary, suspenseful music, almost like Jaws in a way, almost a dun 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 <laughs> Like, I'm just, you're prepared for something bad to happen. We are at Shannon's house, and she is about to talk to John. Yes. She's, like, nervously gulping water. And John goes, so what happened? We get a flashback to, you know, everybody talking about her and John's relationship. And Shannon goes, I, I felt ambushed. It was like a feeding frenzy. Then we get this flashback to Shannon going, I don't have affairs. I have arguments that paralyze me. Yeah, I know, sweetie. That's what concerns everybody. Why do these very normal arguments that you and John have paralyze you? Anyway, John's like, that's ridiculous. So then Shannon goes, I spoke to Heather about something private and she chose to tell the others. Flashback to Emily whispering. She said they got in a huge fight at Nobu. <laughs> and Shannon's like, I have my party tonight. I don't know how that's going to go. Uh, not well, bitch. That's my guess. Shannon's like, I basically told everyone to f*** off. And John goes, well, they just need to shut the f*** up. And you have to be careful who you trust. So, I mean, all in all, guys, I would say John took it pretty well. Well... I mean, at least while the cameras were rolling. Afterward, maybe heads were rolling. I don't know. Or one head in particular. Shannon's. I'm talking about Shannon. Okay, in this next scene, we learn that Emily has been involved for a few years in the California Innocence Project. This is an organization that works to help people who have been wrongly accused and put in prison. And I guess she is attending a gala that's happening later in the week. And right now she is meeting one of the exonerees. And Emily is helping Kimberly pick out a dress for the gala. I guess 100,000 people a year are wrongfully incarcerated in the United States. And not just on a technicality or sentencing issues, but they are just outright innocent. These are people that should not be in prison at all. Side note, my friend Meg and I ha were talking about our irrational fears. I feel like everybody has one. Maybe you don't, but... Um, like, for example, my irrational fear is that I will end up stranded in the ocean overnight. Don't ask me how. I, I fell off a cruise ship, maybe, or maybe I was on a scuba trip and the boat left without me and didn't realize, didn't do the head count right. And so when I came up to the surface, there's nothing around me. And I end up having to um, just like tread water or float. But like my real fear is that it happens like I have to spend the entire night in like the pitch black ocean alone. Now, of course, that's an actual thing that could happen, but it's irrational because it would be very, very unlikely that that would happen to me. I'm not out on the open water that often, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> anyway, that's what mine is. So for my friend Meg, and if you guys knew her, she's just, she just couldn't be sweeter. And she's just so kind. And anyway, hers is and has always been, I don't know if it currently is, but hers was that she would be wrongfully accused of a crime and sent to prison. Which, you know, of course we laughed about it. And I was always like, how would that even happen, you know? But 
Now, hearing that there are 100,000 people a year that that happens to, I mean, yeah, I don't know. That's scary. Anyway, if you guys at home have your own irrational fears, leave them in the comments below. I would love to hear what they are. All right, um, so Kimberly's story, this particular woman, her story, she used to be a nurse, and her story is that she came home from work and found her boyfriend murdered in their home. Emily's like, and there was no evidence, no witnesses, and she said nothing. This was just shoddy police work, and they ruined someone's life. She was in prison for five years before the Innocence Project was able to free her. And now that she's free, she's going back to school uh, to be an EMT, but it's because they would not hire her back as a nurse because, and this just infuriates me, because they didn't think that she showed enough remorse for a crime that she never committed in the first place. That would be like asking you or I to show remorse for killing her boyfriend. I mean, I'm sorry it happened, of course, but how am I going to feel remorse for that? It, I, I don't know. It's infuriating. Okay, now we see Gina and Heather. They're FaceTiming, and they're talking about Shannon's party. Heather's frustrated because she would like to talk to Shannon before the party, but Shannon is already in Huntington Beach setting up. So if Heather wants to talk to her, she's going to have to travel all the way there, which I don't know California, but everything seems like it's far away to me in California, maybe because it's such a huge state. Anyway, she doesn't want to have to, like, truck all the way to Huntington Beach. And Gina's like, I think I'm going to call her and tell her I'm not going to go. I don't think Shannon even wants me there. So Gina says she's going to go to the Innocence Project Gala instead, because then I can feel good about what I'm doing instead of just eating tacos with some nutball who's screaming at me. <laughs> um, side note. Earlier, when we had the scene with Emily and that Kimberly, the exonery, Emily said she had to go back home because she was going to her friend Shannon's party. So uh, this makes no sense to me. Either Gina is going to the gala by herself or Emily really isn't going to. Maybe Emily's doing both. Maybe she's going to stop by Shannon's party and then go to the gala. I don't know. Anyway, Heather said that she was going to go to the party, but now she feels very uncomfortable. So she's just going to go to Huntington Beach and talk to Shannon and hope for a good outcome. And in the next scene, that's what we see. We see Heather showing up and Shannon is, you know, busy getting last minute things ready for this party. And Heather goes, look, I know you're busy, so let's just get right down to it. I know you're not feeling great about things, but I don't like the narrative that I spread gossip about you. And you need to know that I never initiated a conversation about you and John ever. Then she goes, and there are details that are in the vault. And Shannon goes, hold up, you alluding to things being very bad between me and John, that they're just so terrible when it was really only normal relationship stuff, like finding time for each other or dealing with a blended family. That's just wrong, Heather. Uh, okay, I mean, there were other things, Shannon, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> then we get a flashback <laughs> to that confessional of Heather's where she's like, Shannon has to pay for everything. John's son lives with him. John has never spent the night at her house. The family dynamic isn't great. <laughs> so Shannon goes, you are hurting me. And Heather goes, I don't want to hurt you. Shannon, you already did. Heather, you seem to forget that you tell lots of people lots of things. Shannon, great. So now I'm a loony bin. In Heather's confessional, she goes, Shannon drinks, and when she's sad, she calls a plethora of people. Then we see Gina's confessional. She drinks the truth serum, and the truth comes out. Then Tamara's. And the next morning, she has no memory of it. Then Emily's confessional. So you know how after a DUI, sometimes they make you install a breathalyzer in your car so that you can't start your car until you blow into it? Well, Shannon needs one of those on her cell phone. 
She needs to like blow into it before the phone will unlock. <laughs> Which honestly, not the worst idea. That would cure a lot of drunk dialing. A lot of um, regrets in the morning. <laughs> Anyway, Shannon goes, John is a private person. Heather, he's not a private person. Stop saying that. In Heather's confessional, she goes, Shannon has told me and other people that John loves being in the limelight. And it's a lot of the reason why he's with her. Oh, really? That's gross. I hope it's not true. So again, Shannon says she's done. I'm done. I'm out of here. Get the mic off. I'm leaving. I've had enough. Oh, God. And Heather just walks away like, I don't know how we're ever going to resolve this. In the next scene, we are at Jen's house, and she is in the backyard with her son, Dominic. Dominic is nine, and he is um, her adopted son. And, he, uh, you know, he's just screwing around playing with the soccer ball and stuff. And then her daughter, oh, is it Everly? It's, very, it's really pretty name. Anyway, then her daughter comes out with um, one of these kittens that they are fostering. And so they're playing with the kittens for a little bit. And then she goes back inside. And then Jen is having this conversation with Dominic about, you know, she said, do you know what happens to the kittens after we foster them? And he said, they get adopted. And she said, yeah, like you got adopted by us. And he said, yeah. Then we find out that she and her hu ex-husband, Will, adopted Dominic when he was 11 months old. And Bravo shows us this picture. Holy crap, is that an 11-month-old? That kid looks like a toddler. Like, I would say, I'd guess three years old. That does not look like an 11-month-old. And quite honestly, he looks small for nine right now. So I can't believe that was him at 11 months. Unless, I don't know. Maybe this is like a Natalia Grace situation. Side note, did you guys watch The Curious Case of Natalia Grace? I'm not even sure I would say I could recommend it to you because the ending was so unsatisfying. It was like very frustrating and I hated how it ended. It's a six part documentary, but I almost feel like I have to insist that people watch it because the dad, wow, just wow. You just have to see it for yourself. I was so thoroughly entertained by this man who I don't know if he thought he was auditioning for something maybe I, he was a lot I mean the whole story is very bizarre and I would like to know more and I would really like to get some resolve which you are not going to get so a fair warning if you do watch it you're going to just hate that it just kind of leaves you hanging and it's a terrible horrible like ending. There's no sort of closure or anything. Just that's my fair warning. But I'm also going to say it's almost worth it. <laughs> it's almost worth it to watch that dad. It's so crazy. <laughs> so crazy. Anyway, uh, I, I won't give anything away, but the gist of the story was she was adopted and they didn't... Um, know her age. I don't remember now exactly where she was from. But then there were certain things that were occurring that made them feel that she was much older. It's an interesting story. Again, you will hate me for the ending, but uh, it's still worth it. Anyway, I digress. Back to the show. Jen is talking to Dominic about his own adoption and, you know, basically letting him know that if he ever had any questions about his birth mother, he can always come to her and, um, you know, he can ask her anything he wants and she's there for him. And, you know, basically, other than the fact that this happened on camera, I feel like Jen handled the discussion well. Her Questions were a little leading at one point. I didn't care for that. But all in all, I mean, she just seems like a really kind person. She does. And I. it makes me hate even more that I feel like she's being taken advantage of in her relationship. I don't know. She seems so naive to me. Maybe she's not. 
Maybe she's not. In any case, whatever she's doing, he seems like a very happy little boy. Okay, over at Heather's house, she and Terry are signing all the escrow papers for the purchase of their penthouse in L.A. And also, they are in escrow for their house. Yeah. Terry's like, yep, Heather wanted three things. And then her confessional, she said, they were, one, buy a penthouse in L.A., check. Two, sell their home in Orange County, check. They settled on $55 million. It's 10 million less than Josh said they will get, but, uh, you know, hey, what's $10 million? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it seems so crazy. And then she said the third thing she can't disclose yet. All right, so uh, back in Huntington Beach, uh, Shannon has come back to sort of fluff up her paper flowers, still bustling around to get things ready for her party. She says she's sorry that Heather won't be there, but, you know, more tequila for the rest of us. And now we see her FaceTiming Emily. And I got to tell you, they have pretty much the same conversation she had with Heather. Shannon, if you're concerned about my relationship, then you come to me, not Tamara. And, you know, I have a normal relationship. Not perfect, but normal. And Emily goes, you know what, Shannon? You share a bunch of bull with everyone off camera, and then you don't want to take any accountability for it. I'm tired of it always being everyone else's fault, Shannon. Shannon, have you ever had an argument? And Emily goes, oh, are you kidding? I'm married to Shane. She didn't say that. Uh, she just said, yeah, of course. I argue with Shane all the time. But then I talk about it. That's the difference. Emily is like yelling at Shannon. And she's like, you're, you know what? You're two different people, Shannon. You're Jekyll and Hyde. And I'm tired of it. Shannon. Wow. That's a very hurtful and disappointing statement. I wear my heart on my sleeve, Emily. And Emily goes, oh, okay. So now Shannon kind of, she starts yelling and getting loud. And Emily goes, you know what? I'm not doing this over FaceTime. I I'm not coming tonight. Have fun at your party. And then she tries desperately for about 15 minutes to hang up the FaceTime call, which, you know, admittedly, it should be easier. It's almost like you have to hit the screen so that the little thing pops up that with the red X then hit the red X, and then there might even be another red X. I don't remember. The only person I'm really FaceTiming with usually is my daughter, and she just hangs up on me. So, <laughs> and that's the way we like it. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, okay, see ya. Okay, bye. Swiping. Anyway, that was Emily stabbing at the phone, poking, 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 and finally disconnecting. So then Shannon looks at the, like, the production crew, and she goes, well, she hung up on me. She's not coming. I'm out. Oh, my God. She is Shannon stormsing out again. That is definitely her signature move. She loves a good storm out. Then Emily starts talking to the production crew where she is, and she's like, you know, I was just calling her to tell her I was going to be a little late, but forget that. And I love tacos. So if I'm going to miss that, you know I'm pissed. Shannon, to her camera crew, please, can, can we not film this? This is my life. Yeah, Shannon, you're on a reality TV show. We're supposed to be filming your life. When she says things like, can you not film this? This is my life. It makes me really think, what's all the other stuff we're watching? Is that like not real just for the cameras? Because it seems like when things get real, you don't want the cameras there. And I find that interesting for somebody who signed on to do a reality show. Emily, to her producers, she's on a reality show. Thank you, Emily. Shannon, to her producers. I mean, if they're assholes enough to bring up the details, does he spend enough time with me? Is there going to be enough money? His kid doesn't like me. I can't talk about that on camera. Th and this can't go on the camera. Oh, bad news, Shannon. <laughs> it went on the camera. You're saying this to the cameraman. 
And it made the final cut. So, sorry. Sorry about that. All right. Now we are in the car with Gina and Emily. And yes, they are heading to, is it San Diego? Mm, again, don't know California. But yeah, they are heading to the uh, Innocence Project Gala. So I assume that when we saw the confessional with Gina, we just saw it out of order. Gina already knew that Emily wasn't going to Shannon, so um, that explains that. We see another little scene with an, another exoneree. This is a man that I can't remember how many years he was in prison, like a long time. He was like an 18-year-old kid and uh, innocent. So anyway, the, it's it's hard to see, but it's, you know... It's good to learn that this is happening and that we need to do something about it. He actually is spending time now because Emily goes, you know, you could just be bitter and spend the rest of your, you know, life being angry and stuff, but you're not. And uh, you're actually doing something about it, which he is. He's working with politicians to change policies so that this does not happen to another kid. So it's kind of awesome. And Emily and Gina end up talking about how it really puts things in perspective for them. You complain about your own life and then you see something like this and you realize it's just not, your problems just aren't that important. You don't really have anything to complain about. Cut to Shannon. This was a little unfair to Shannon, but of course. I'm so upset. I'm racing around here. John's there now. And he's like, babe, you don't really have time. John, stop. Stop, John, please. And he goes, I'm just trying to help. I am devastated right now because everyone knows how excited I was. And now six people aren't coming. At first, I was like, six? I mean, it's Heather, Gina, and Emily. Who else isn't coming? And then, and then we see the graphic. It's their significant others, but... It's the funniest graphic of like the the three couples with an X through like a red X through them. <laughs> and Shannon's like, and I bought for 16 and it's expensive. Yeah, I mean, I guess when you have to pay for everything all the time, things do add up. If only John helped out. <laughs> Allegedly. So Shannon's dressed now, and um, like I said, it's at the Huntington Beach Club. It's pretty, it's outside, and it's being catered by Senior Noodles. And <laughs> Shannon, at one point she goes, Noodles, can we light these candles over here? She's like, yeah, go ahead. I, is his name Noodles? Is that like how you address the man that works at Senior Noodles? <laughs> hey, Noodles. Oh, okay. Well, the star of this party is clearly Shannon's friend, Lisa, who is aggressively supporting Shannon. Like, aggressively. Eddie and Tamara are the first couple to arrive, like the first housewife couple to arrive. And as they're coming around the corner, Eddie's like, there better be a lot of people here. <laughs> uh, there's not. Sorry, Eddie. According to my calculations, there will be 10 people now. Anyway, aggressive Lisa says to them, well, I'm glad you guys are here to support our friend. Okay, Lisa, calm down. I mean, you might want to back off the people that actually did show up. They're not the ones you should be angry with. And also, listen, if one person doesn't show up because they're mad at Shannon for whatever reason, go ahead and take your friend's side in the argument. But when three people aren't showing up, uh, you might want to take a closer look at your buddy Shannon and see if it maybe it's something she's doing. All right. So anyway, Taylor and her husband, John, arrive and Jen and Ryan. And that is it for like the housewives. And Shannon goes, well, this is it. We're it. This is the party. And Jen goes, this is it. Shannon. Yep. Heather, Gina and Emily are not coming. But hey, you've got aggressive Lisa in the town whore, so should still be a fun night. And oh, there is a lot of tequila flowing. Yeah, she wasn't kidding when she said she bought for 16. The, the camera is like blurring the screen so that, you know, us at home can feel the full effects of the tequila. Then we cut to the Innocence Project Gala, where Gina is like in the audience looking on proudly at Emily, who's like giving a speech or she's 
Up there introducing somebody, I guess. Back at Shannon's dinner, she gives a little speech as well. That is abruptly interrupted by John telling her that she's got salt on her nose. I assume from a margarita. I'm sure aggressive Lisa is kicking him under the table for that one. Do not interrupt Shannon. We're here to support her. Anyway, Shannon's like, well, it has been quite a day, but everyone I love and care about is here. And Ryan. It's so dumb. Like, Eddie doesn't even like Shannon. Yet, this is the group she ended up with, and so it, according to her, this is like her real friends or something. <laughs> really? Didn't you just meet Taylor and Jen? So then Eddie, who's like pretty drunk, he goes, listen, I'm just so glad that we could be here to celebrate your relationship. First of all, I forget, but is it, this is like a party for her business, right? Her lemon business, real, real to real or whatever it's called. So there's a whole lot of reasons why that's wrong, but also it's kind of funny. And they do laugh and John goes, it's not perfect. It's not, it's not perfect. No relationship is. And everyone's like, yeah, yeah, no relationship is. In Tamara's confessional, she said, you know, sitting across from them, on the surface, everything looks good between Shannon and John. But will they get married one day? No. My gut tells me no. And my gut is never wrong. Wow. Thanks, Tamara. So yeah, uh, then Eddie says, you mean you're not f***ing some other girl? And there's, you know, nervous laughter. And then out of the dark corner at the end of the table, Ryan pops up. Eddie! Eddie, that's my job. I told you guys the town whore would come through and make this party fun. Oh, you know what? It feels wrong to continuously refer to Ryan as the town whore. So from now on, I'm just going to call him TW. And we'll all know what it means. So Jen said to Shannon, listen, I haven't gone through this myself with this group. I'm really sorry that you're going through it. Nobody should have their relationship scrutinized that way. And Shannon's like, thank you. I appreciate that. And side note, is no one other than Gina that last week going to talk about how Shannon is talking about her relationship? How, you know... If she doesn't stop talking about her ex, Travis is going to leave and, you know, we're just, we're just forgetting that. So as Noodles is serving their dinner, Taylor wonders how Shannon is ever going to, like, resolve things with the other three. And they're like, I don't know. And Taylor said, listen, after coming into this friend group and seeing what Shannon's been going through, I'd like to know who I can trust and who I can't. Tamara. Well, I think it's pretty clear. Who's sitting at the table and who isn't? No, it's not clear. Isn't, that's not clear to me. And Taylor, please don't judge who you should trust or not by who's at the table and who isn't. Although, to be fair, I do feel like aggressive Lisa is a keeper. No matter how wrong you are, she will have your back. Oh, thank you, Jen. She brings up Shannon talking about Travis and Gina. She tells Shannon that, or I guess the whole table, that she was shopping with Gina and that she mentioned that Shannon was talking about her relationship with Travis. And Jen's like, you know, she felt like you were kind of poking around into her relationship. And Shannon goes, oh, in Montana, I talked to her about it. Because I know if I was three years into my relationship with John Jansen and I still kept talking about David Bedore, he'd be like, get the f*** out. Isn't he kind of like that already? So then she says that she tried to be kind to Gina and she said, I helped her out with her DUI. Um, according to Shannon, Gina was about to be arrested at 8 a.m. when she had her kids. They would have gone to Child Protective Services if it wasn't for me. Yeah, I guess she called her friend in the DA's office at like 10 o'clock at night and, I don't know, called in a favor, I guess. So while she's saying that, Tamara is kind of reaching behind Eddie to explain to Jen that, yeah, Gina got a DUI, she got arrested, and she's like, oh, okay. Jen's like taking in all this new information, but then in her confessional, Jen goes, oh my God, 
This is not dinner conversation to talk about someone's DUI. I don't care how much you helped her. If I was Gina, I would be pissed. Uh Uh-huh. So you know this is getting back to Gina. Anyway, then a tequila gun is brought out. Basically, Noodles and Tamara are just making a great effort to try and make this party not seem lame. I don't know. I guess they're having fun. What do I care? Okay, the next scene is in the penthouse in L.A. that Heather just bought. And she and Terry are showing it to their son, Nikki. She's like, okay, so do you know who Roberto Cavalli is? And her son's like, no. And she goes, okay, well, he is a very famous Italian designer. And this is the first home that he designed in the United States. So he's like, wow. Um, So, like... They go around and it, like like the dining room table is like marble and it's got his initials and gold. I don't know, some kind of metal. The doors are stone and suede. The door, the kitchen door is suede. Yuck. That is a designer who is confident that the person that buys that penthouse will do zero cooking in that kitchen. There will be no grease spattering anywhere, least of all on my suede doors. Now, I mean, I just, it's so grossly, like, ornate to me anyway. Yeah, I don't, I don't like it. She was meeting with a designer earlier. If one more person calls it sexy, I'm going to vomit all over those suede doors. (laughs) Try getting that out. It's just yucky. And then Heather asks, Terry, have you told anyone that the house in Orange County is an escrow. And he said, no, I haven't told a soul. It's nobody's business. And Heather's like, yeah, I I haven't told anybody either. It's nobody's business other than the fact that, why do I have to keep reminding these people they're on a reality TV show? It, It is our business because you get paid to show your life on TV. I mean, you know there's a cameraman in the room while you're having this conversation saying it's nobody's business. <laughs> so weird to me. Anyway, um, in her confessional, Heather said, you know, I'm not going to say anything about it. It's way too early for that. You know, we signed an NDA. And until all the contingencies are released, I'm not packing a single box. Now, my guess is that after all the contingencies are released and the sale is final, She's still not packing a single box. Heather Fancy Pants Dubrow, I feel like, does not do her own packing. (laughs) Okay? Okay, next we are at Jen's house, and it is the day after the fiesta party, and Gina is coming over to visit. Apparently, they only live five minutes away from each other, and they've become pretty close. It's so funny because at the very beginning of the season, I feel like Gina wanted to hate Jen because she cheated on her husband, you know. But yeah, I think, yeah, honestly, it's hard to be mad at Jen. She's kind of a sweetheart. So she's like, you know, what happened to you last night? Why didn't you show up? And Gina goes, well, you know, mostly it's because I didn't want to be responsible for messing up Shannon's dinner party. We left with her being so super defensive and thinking I was trashing her relationship, which I was not. And here we go. Jen goes, well, she didn't really say anything about you talking about her and John. What she alluded to when it comes to you is how she helped you with your DUI, that she helped you through that, and that your kids would have gone to Child Protective Services if she didn't step in. And Gina goes, what? Okay, well, that is fucking absurd. There was zero chance of my children going to CPS. And if she opened her mouth and said anything even remotely close to that, I'm going to have a really big problem. Yeah, well, you're going to have a really big problem because she did say that. Gina's like, she passed along a phone number to me because I needed an attorney's help. Then she's like, she is always going to remind me what a saint she is. And that's just cruel. Jen agrees. So now Gina considers her friendship with Shannon to be over. It's done. After that, if she really said that about her kids being taken away, it's done. But she does want to have a conversation with her so that she will stop talking. 
Gina's like, you can't just light me on fire and let everybody watch me burn just to take the focus off of you. Or can you? Because that is kind of what she did. She really didn't take any kind of responsibility for talking about Travis and Gina other than like, all I know is if it was me and, you know, three years later, I'm still talking about my ex, my boyfriend would leave me. So in that way, she thinks she's helping Gina, I guess. But I don't know why she can't equate that to how people were concerned about the things that she said about John, their relationship. Gina wasn't even complaining about her relationship. Shannon just stepped in to say, "Mm, you better watch it or he's going to leave. That doesn't make it any more okay than it does for your friends to be concerned about things you told them about your own relationship even if you don't remember. Okay, so now we are at lunch at the Paragon with Shannon and Emily. Shannon tells us in her confessional that she cares about Emily a lot. And lately, I don't feel like it's mutual. So that's why I asked her here to this lunch to see if that's the case. So they order, um, (laughs) Shannon asks, what do you have that's low fat? And the girl said, well, the summer salad is good. That's what I get for lunch. And Shannon's reply is, okay, I'll have a cheeseburger. And Emily goes, I'll have a cheeseburger too, Shannon, without a bun. And Emily goes, I want all the bread, a whole loaf. And the girl goes, oh, we have a really good sourdough loaf. Do you want that? And Emily said, yes. I mean, (laughs) do you guys seriously think she's going to bring out an entire loaf of bread for Emily? And also that Shannon has to stare at? That's not very nice. Okay, so Emily starts to apologize for the FaceTime call. She's like, it was crazy. Out of, I was out of control. I apologize for that. Shannon says, okay, but that she was really hurt. If I was concerned about you and your future, I would talk to you about it. And Emily goes, okay, tell me what I did. Shannon, you talked about me behind my back. And Emily goes, we had a conversation about you and John because we were concerned about you. Are we not allowed to do that? Okay, two things. One, apparently not. She wants you to to talk to her about it, not each other. And two, this conversation happened behind her back with Tamara. Yet Tamara gets a full pass? That's what I don't get. Tamara and Emily... We're talking about Shannon and John's relationship. Both of them were talking about it. Yet Shannon is mad at Emily for having that conversation, but she isn't mad at Tamara for having the same exact conversation. I don't get that. Plus, you just started to be friends with Tamara again. And and yet Tamara's like, it's just, I don't know. She gets a full pass. So the question from Emily was, is that not okay to do? And Shannon said, no, because I think that you exaggerate. Did I talk about drugs or, or cheating or abuse? And Emily goes, I never said anything like that. And when Tamara asked, I said, absolutely not. Also, Tamara said she had heard it too. She said that you know, Heather talked to her about it or somebody. She heard it too. So I again, it's so bizarre to me that some people are getting blamed for the exact same thing other people are doing. I don't know. So anyway, Shannon now just immediately goes off on Heather. Heather was insinuating that it's all bad stuff. She is a liar. Emily goes, and I agree with that. And Shannon goes, and she said that you brought it up to her and Gina brought it up to her and Tamara brought it up to her. That she never brought it up. And Emily goes, I did not bring it up to her. Shannon. Heather has a history of making things seem worse than they really are. Then we get this hilarious flashback to 2014. It was Lizzie, Heather, skinny Shannon. And Shannon is doing her Shannon move where she gets up from the table and storms out. I've had it with her and you guys will all see the truth. And she's storming out. And Heather says to Terry, as Shannon's exiting the party, Terry, Terry, do you think we, sorry, Terry, do you think we need to call an ambulance? Terry, why? What's happening? Heather, because I think she's having a psychotic break. (laughs) 
I guess maybe Heather does exaggerate a little. Anyway, now Shannon is telling Emily, Heather Dubro is calculating and manipulative. And Emily goes, can we just reserve Heather for just a minute? Because I want to talk about you and I. I would like us to move past this. I won't say anything more about you and John. And if I have a concern, I will come directly to you with it. She's like tearing up. And she said, your friendship means more to me. There was never any ill will. And I mean that 100%. I care about you. I care about your kids. I care about your relationship. I want you to be happy. So Shannon's like, I appreciate that. Then the burgers come out. Emily's with a bun. Shannon's without a bun. The loaf of sourdough is sitting there. I'm sure it's warm. There's butter. And I knew this was going to happen. Shannon, I'm just going to have a little piece. She's buttering it. I mean, that alone is reason not to be friends with Emily. You do not sabotage a friend's diet, girl. Anyway, like I said, Emily is just like pouring her heart out to Shannon. She's had trouble sleeping at night thinking about Shannon. It's crazy. And Shannon in her confessional said, I feel pretty good about this meeting with Emily, but I'm going to proceed with caution. Yeah. And that was it, you guys. I don't know what Emily has to do to get her to believe her. My God. The girl's not sleeping at night. What, what more do you want from her? And also, everything that she heard, like Heather saying that her relationship was bad, that came from Tamara. Tamara said she said it was really bad. I mean, talk about exaggerating. It's just interesting to me who Shannon is trusting here. I find it very interesting. But, you know, we'll see how it goes. We can't all be as loyal as aggressive Lisa. So other than her, I think Shannon needs to, you know, reassess her friendships. <laughs> All right, that's it for me, guys. If you liked this recap, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please consider doing so. Also, click on the bell icon if you would like to be notified every time I have posted something new. In the description box below, check out my Amazon links. I am an Amazon affiliate and will get a small percentage of anything that you purchase from Amazon after going through one of my links. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.